I once read somewhere that the easiest way for a non-sailor to experience what it's like to actually go sailing is to stand fully clothed in a cold shower and tear up a big pile of money. So, if that doesn't sound like too much fun to you, then you definitely wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere near the Celtic Sea on the night of the 13th of August 1979 when over 300 boats taking part in the Fastnet yacht race ran into what's been described as the perfect freak storm. The Fastnet race is one of the biggest events in the sailing calendar, a challenging biannual offshore race which tests the skill of sailors in both the open ocean and racing close to the shore. The 600 odd mile route takes the competitors from the Isle of Wight on England's south coast, out past the windswept Cape of Land's End and across the southern expanse of the Celtic Sea, round the sheer crag of Fastnet Rock, complete with its imposing lighthouse, and then back again, finishing up in Plymouth. It's not for the faint-hearted or particularly inexperienced sailor this race. The stretch of water from Land's End to the southern coast of Ireland is prone to being hammered by storms and depressions which roll in from the vast open reaches of the Atlantic. These give rise to challenging blue water sailing conditions which become even more tricky when passing the rocky cliffs and jagged rocks that the route takes you close to. All the time, hundreds of boats are jostling for position, increasing exponentially the chances of a collision. This race will often push a crew to its limits. Indeed, if the weather forecast is looking particularly grim, as it was in 2007, then the start of the race will be delayed as it's just simply too dangerous to set off, even for modern yachts. Most of the time, even with all the hazards and the dangers of racing this course, the skill and the experience of the sailors is enough to bring everyone home in one piece. Founded all the way back in 1925, there had only been one fatality in the history of the race, but that was all changed in 1979, when 303 racing yachts set off on Saturday August the 11th to complete in the 28th Fastnet race. Now for most yachts the time to complete the race is anywhere between 3.5 to 5 days, which gives plenty of time for the weather to change, so keeping up to date with the latest shipping forecast was imperative. The shipping forecast for August the 11th, that was the day the race began, seemed fairly benign. Southwesterly winds, 4 to 5, increasing to 4, 6 to 7 for a time. Now to me that sounds like perfect sailing weather if you've got an experienced crew. So as the 303 yachts carrying over 2,500 sailors set off from the Isle of Wight, they did so in very light winds, and one competitor said it was more like being on holiday than being in a race but the clear skies were not to last. By Sunday, the racers were becalmed in foggy, windless conditions off Land's End, and it seemed that the race had gotten off to a very slow start. Competitors anticipated an uneventful race that was unlikely to break any records. The impatient crews must have been relieved as the wind began to pick up and the yachts headed out into the Celtic Sea in freshening conditions. What nobody knew at the time was that a deep depression which had been heightened in intensity by merging with a sharp cold front, had just swung 90 degrees from its original course and was barreling up out of the Atlantic straight into the path of the Fastnet race. Now you've got to remember that back in 1979 there's no GPS, there's no mobile phones, there's no sat-nav. In fact, competitors in the race were only allowed to use a sextant, RDF, a map and a compass. Marine radios back then were very big and expensive and they were only carried on the bigger yachts. Many of the smaller boats had to rely purely on the weather forecast that was picked up on small handheld FM AM radios. And if that weather forecast wasn't up to date, a storm could hit and most boats wouldn't have any idea until it was right up on top of them. Sailors described a humid start to Monday the 13th with light, changeable winds that were constantly shifting. The shipping forecast given out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon stated Sol Fastnet Shannon, southwesterly gale, force 8 imminent. However, over 90% of the vessels in the race didn't hear that shipping forecast. For them, the first signs of the freak storm appeared during the night of Monday the 13th of August when yachtsmen described watching the air pressure barometer falling like a stone and at the same time waves began piling up 
and the boat started to be tossed around like corks in a whirlpool. Experienced sailors who'd been in all kinds of other weather conditions had said that they'd never seen anything like it. Wave heights from trough to crest were estimated to have been anywhere between 50 to 60 feet, with waves breaking on the top and cascading avalanches of water down the vertical faces into the troughs below. Now, it might sound like an exaggeration, coming from wet, terrified sailors who were clinging for dear life onto the boats, but this wave height was also verified by the crews of rescue helicopters and the RAF Nimrod plane that took part in the rescue effort. Throughout the night of the 13th and the 14th of August, conditions continued to deteriorate, and the wind was estimated at times to have been blowing at gale force 11. There were massive seas, there were waves piling up in all directions. The boats were being continually slammed down onto their sides, their masts, sails and rigging torn away like wet paper towels. Sailors were thrown out of the boat cockpits and into the ocean, dragged along with safety harnesses like fish hooked on lines. They couldn't do anything other than hold their breath for as long as possible and try and get back onto the boat when they had a lull between the waves. 17-year-old Matthew Sheehan was on board one of the smaller boats that night, the 30-foot Grimalkin. With him was his father David and crew members Jerry Winks, Mick Doyle, Nick Ward and Dave Wheeler. In his own words, he remembers vividly the terror of that night as the little boat was swept along at incredible speed through the storm. The continual howl of the storm was deafening, but the rumble and hiss generated by this outrageous burst of speed rose above the background. A soul-chilling surge of fear swept through us all as we heard the terrifying sound of a wave breaking 40 foot above us. In just a few seconds, the wave was bearing down on us from behind like an avalanche. We dare not look back. There was no escape. There was simply nowhere to go. A split second before the onslaught from astern, the bow disappeared as we nosedived into a wall of water in front. No one had seen that coming, not that it would have done any good if they had. Grimalkin's stern rose until it arched over the bow and we stood on our nose. A split second later, we were hit from astern by the breaking wave and we pitch poled. Now, pitch poling means that the boat basically does a front somersault. The bow is dug deep into the sea at the front while a monster wave hits from behind and just flips the boat over, end over end. So anyone who was on the deck was thrown straight out of the boat and the only hope of surviving was a safety line that connected your harness to something that's clipped onto the boat. But as the storm raged all around, Matthew Sheehan found himself just being towed along under the water. He miraculously came up alongside the Grimalkin just before he ran out of air. All across the Celtic Sea, the storm was hammering the racing yachts. Stricken sailors were floating in the sea, clinging to wreckage, or they'd abandoned ship and taken to inflatable life rafts, hoping to ride out the storm. And it was into these terrible conditions that lifeboats from the Irish coast, Cornwall and South Wales, went out on the night of the 13th to 14th of August, putting their own lives at risk to save the hundreds of sailors who were in peril. By dawn, the winds had dropped a bit to only gale force 9, and the Royal Navy helicopters joined the rescue efforts as well as an RAF Nimrod, a spotter plane that was able to guide the lifeboats to the stricken vessels. Having the aircraft gave the lifeboats a huge advantage, as without them it had been almost impossible to catch sight of anything in the ocean, just simply due to the sheer size of the waves. By now, sailors were not only suffering the fatigue of being constantly hammered by the monstrous waves and repeatedly being capsized, but hypothermia was starting to set in. Previously alert crewmen were now dazed and confused, they were failing to perform necessary tasks like setting off distress flares, or they were forgetting simple things like how to zip up your life jacket or attach your safety harness. Many by now were lethargic, slumped motionless in the cockpits of their battered vessels, unable to save themselves, let alone anybody else. On board the little boat, the Grimalkin, the crew was in a dire state. Matt Sheehan's father, David, had been knocked unconscious by flying debris while he was below decks trying to send out a mayday call, and crew members Nick Ward and Jerry Winks were both suffering from hypothermia and struggling to remain conscious. Yet again, their small boat was hit on the side by a monster wave, sending her just rolling over, capsizing the vessel and trapping the crew underneath. 
Matt Sheehan was unable to move, he was pinned to the side by his safety line, and he was only able to snatch breaths as the Grimalkin rose and fell in the waves. The rescue effort of the 1979 Fastnet race was the largest peacetime rescue operation in modern British history. For 24 hours, helicopters, nimrods, lifeboats struggled in terrible conditions to rescue stricken sailors, recover bodies and tow in abandoned vessels. The rescue was coordinated by the Irish and the UK Coast Guards, with an incredible 4,000 people being involved, including British, Irish and Dutch naval vessels and aircraft. From the 303 boats which started the race, only 86 crossed the finish line. The rest either had to retire and limp to the nearest port, or they were badly damaged and abandoned. At least five boats were never seen again, they were presumed sunk, and a total of 21 people lost their lives in the storm. Included amongst the dead were two from the Grimalkin, Matt Sheehan's father David and crewman Jerry Winks. Meteorologists who latest studied the storm concluded that the deep depression which formed had kind of been turbocharged by a column of cold air which apparently just crashed down from the stratosphere and broke the storm into two. This produced freak conditions with enormous waves, very confused seas and winds that were gusting apparently up to 80 knots. Jerry Butler, one of the lighthouse keepers on the Fastnet Rock that night, witnessed firsthand how the tragedy unfolded. It was such a horrific event. The storm just popped up out of the blue, and it blew with such rage and strength that the sea was mountainous. During the course of the entire night, it was yacht after yacht after yacht getting into trouble and calling for help. Jerry recalls seeing the crest of some of the waves hitting about 20 feet below the lighthouse balcony. If you look at that photograph, I mean, it almost beggars belief how big those waves must have been. Now, these terrible conditions were compounded by the almost non-existent communication systems on most boats, there was inadequate safety gear, and people were sailing in boats that were simply not designed or built to just take that amount of punishment. However, the overriding factor was the terrible weather and the sheer ferocity of the storm in which the sailors found themselves. As one captain said later on, it didn't matter how big your boat was or how experienced you were, you were not in control that night. That night, it was the cruel sea that was controlling you. Indeed, some of those involved in the 79 Fastnet race have gone on to do many round-the-world trips, other offshore races and extreme sailing challenges, and they still maintain to this day that the weather that they encountered that night in the Celtic Sea was without doubt the worst that they've ever seen. Needless to say, the loss of life prompted major changes to the Fastnet race and a general rethink of the risk assessments made when allowing boats to enter the race. And to my knowledge, there's been no further fatalities during any of the subsequent Fastnet races. But then again, there's never been another Fastnet race running conditions to compare with that one of 79. Even with the terrible loss of life and the overall disaster scenario of the race, there was still a winner. And funnily enough, it was Ted Turner, the bloke who founded CNN. He skippered the winning yacht and he completed the course in three days and eight hours.